to look at all their work, you have to see what is in the studio. And there is a very bad feeling sometimes that whatever is left in the studio cannot be very good because it has not been sold. And I found that it's usually the reverse because some of the works not sold are sometimes some of the strongest and uh, in my estimation the best works because they either uh, are not very pleasant and usually customers like something which is really pretty or they don't have to think about and I like tough paintings so I would think when you look around this show you don't see too many pretty things they're kind of dark, uh, moody and uh, very, very strong as far as I'm concerned now, I don't like to talk about paintings because I feel if you can talk about it in words what will you bother paint? So I will not uh, say too much about the painting themselves. If you have any technical questions, and if you are students, you may. So this is the man to ask, because he's the one who did the paintings, and he's the one who knows. The one thing that I really like to uh, point out is that every time you're in an exhibition, I always feel that those kind of walks through when you go from one painting to another are not making sense to me. Because I feel I want to get a sense of the full installation together and see as many as I can at the same time. Because this one is going to work against this one and then vice versa. So I, when I go to a museum, for example, and they have a big show, I can stand the idea that you're behind somebody who is usually listening to something and you go from one painting to another. And to me, it's very boring, and I don't, I don't enjoy that at all, even if it's a Picasso show or whatever show it is. I really like to see several paintings at once, which doesn't mean that you don't want to zero in on some paintings and look at them very carefully. And I think one of the problems that after 47 years in the gallery, one of the problems I saw is that a lot of people did not know how to look. They kind of take a quick, they were taking a quick tour of the gallery and leave. And then if you ask, do you like to show them? They usually say yes. And I kept thinking, what on earth did I see? Because they can't, you know, you can't spend just five minutes in a room and see even nine or ten paintings. So for example, if you, if you want to come on this side, I would like you to look at the painting in the back there, which is called Thunder, something uh, Forgotten. Forgotten Thunder. And if you look at it for and then It makes me think of the earth, it makes me think of stones. Now I'm a stone collector, so I love to look at stones. Even the, the most uh, ordinary stone has a lot to offer. And uh, a painting like this painting, I feel, has so many details and so many um, elements in it that it's wonderful to look close by, but you would lose the general feeling of it if you're too close. So it's really nice to be able, and it's a great room for that, to be able to look at it from, from far away. And I would think that about nearly every, every painting. The one on the left, which is called You Were Blue. Where on earth did you get such a title? Which one? You Were Blue? One Were Blue. Oh, one Were Blue? Yes. Oh, well, you know. Who's my one? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Abby. I think titles mean nothing. And I feel if I really upset when I go to a show of still life with skull, or still life with vase of flower. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I don't need to be told. I mean, paintings like this, it's more difficult. Sometimes the title gives you an idea of you know, what the work is about. But it's not, I'm not always in tune with what the artist I've done because I put my own <coughs> and 
when you first met into it. And I think that's what's important with looking at a painting, is to be able to have a reaction and have the painting speak to you. That you like it or not, that's not important. It could be a very negative uh, response, but you, you have to have a response. And if you don't, then I don't think the work is worth very much. So now that's my point of view. A lot of people love titles, and that's the first thing they see. And if you're in a gallery where they also have prices, that's also the first thing they look at. Which makes sense if you want to buy a painting, I guess. But uh, in a setting like this, I like the fact that there is no titles and no, uh, no prices. <laughs> Now Norman Lundin, whom you may all know because he's also a well-known painter, is for no titles. I remember in some shows you have, you never have titles in, in your own gallery. You may do in, uh, you did in the gallery, but not. There's a printout hidden over in the corner. Right. Yeah, yes. Right. Okay. So that's one thing. The, the thing with title that could be useful is that sometimes it gets you, you memorize the title at the same time than the painting. So if you're talking to other people and you're talking about the painting, to have the title immediately bring the image to your mind, at least to mine. And if that was called number 41, I might forget what the painting looks like. It wouldn't have any connection, but having a, a title then makes a makes the connection. So what, uh, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> Any questions? Any special questions? Ask Dale something. Dale, you want to, to answer something about why have you been involved with encaustic? I've always been interested about that because it's not a medium a lot of people have used. Although, they just opened a museum for encaustic only in Santa Fe. Last month, or this month, which is interesting. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the school, the student programs for helping fund this, and Chad White, the gallery director back there, Chad. And Naomi, who helped with the catalog, and, and mostly Francie, who was a joy to be able to do something with, picking out the work. And she arranged it, uh, though, unlike her gallery, she didn't have to get up on a ladder and hang it, right? it's like, so we saved her that. Yeah. Chad did that. <laughs> um, I'll answer the encaustic question. I was kind of, I'm more of a reactor than I am a uh, <laughs> presenter. So I was thinking about when Francine said, when you look at things, most people don't know how to look. Uh, Reminds me when I teach beginning drawing, which I'm on spatical issues, so I haven't done it for a few months. But uh, people can really see well, I tell my students, because they've all gotten the classroom and them are all bumped up, their knees are okay. So they obviously saw well enough to drive over here and get in the road. But I don't think many people think about you know why they see the way they do, or basically you see what you think. And so if you can't think it, you're probably not going to see it. Uh, so most people think of labels. There we go to titles. Mm -hmm. If it was up to me, I'd probably have no titles. I mean, titles are like the hardest things for me to come up with. I'm working with the paintings, working with the painting, and then suddenly it's like, well, what do we call it? And I think it'd be called gray number one, and Francine's correct that, you know, two days later, I think, which one's gray number one? Is that gray <laughs> number three four? I can't remember. Uh, so I title things usually with the help of you know, friends, family, anybody, like, what do you think we should call this? I mean, I, have, I will reject a lot. Norman, actually, his theory, if I remember it correctly, is that if you have, you know, two peaches in a bowl, you can call it two peaches in a bowl because it really means nothing because everybody can see the yeah, two peaches in a bowl. But obviously, if nobody thinks it's just two peaches in a bowl, there must be something else to it. Now, an abstract painting, if you call it number one, people go, well, I wonder if that means number one, right? Or not titled. Or no title, or untitled, or yet to be titled. Right. So there's all the people, I used to think, so untitled would be good. Never goes <laughs> or yet to be titled. Untitled sounds yeah. unfinished in a way. Yeah, and so I title them, uh, 
to kind of give a clue of maybe, uh, let's say that one. I thought, I don't know, desert, uh, desert, desert storm, and I thought, well, forgotten thunder, simply because it seems like something that passed, you know, yeah, it's a little stormy. But, I mean, I know that, I remember the other one on the right, uh, somebody came in and said, oh, it reminds me of, as the opening in 1999 I had, and said, well, it looks like, uh, like I was on a volcano in Hawaii, and I felt like this, I felt this feeling. And I thought, well, that's a good metaphor. It's not the one I had, but, you know, I could see what you could see that, say that because it feels kind of like the way it feels to me, only your metaphor is different than mine. My dad, I remember, said, looks like a fireplace. He wasn't a big artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, not an encaustic. Encaustic is uh, a medium that I probably started in the 70s using uh, before I moved. Fannings, which is uh, beeswax, the more varnish. Um, it's an ancient method where you melt up the wax, like a lot of uh, the old Greek sculptures were painted with encaustic, it looked like mannequins. Or funeral portraits in Egypt by the Greeks in Ptolemy's period, the caskets had uh, encaustic paintings. But basically you heat it up, helps to have it on a hard surface, because if you bend it, it cracks, because the demar makes it very uh, brittle. But you drop it on his face and probably nothing would happen. But it's like an inert material beeswax in the varnish. And when I was doing these, back when I was doing encaustics, I was like uh, whittling blocks of beeswax. <laughs> and then, you know that's not me. <laughs> I get in trouble with that because I never carry a cell phone. I leave it in the car just so it won't go off. So I can yell at students saying, get rid of that cell phone. Uh, I uh, would whittle it and then take the mar crystals and put them in like uh, a beet, uh, cheese cloth and then pour turpentine over it and then heat it up. Well, guess what? Where's the turpentine go? In the studio and people would come into my studio and go, oh my goodness. And I'd go, what? I don't smell anything. But that's how I was doing it at the time. And so they're all on like panels. And I think some of these older ones are like on linen or canvas glued to it. Yeah. Uh, and then you melt it, paint it on, you can melt it when it's on. And it's very long lasting materials. It's some of the oldest paintings that are made of that. Uh, and I did that and I stopped doing it simply because I thought maybe smelling all that turpentine wasn't a good idea. And so then for the next 25 years, I basically all this one's encaustic, that one's encaustic from about the same period, showing the Francine's gallery in about 1991, and the one tall one over there was encaustic uh, from about the same period. Which, back to titles again, reminds me of Sunday at the Euro in 1991, whatever it was. This guy came in and said, Oh, it looks like, like when I'm flying into Alaska, I'm a pilot, and that's exactly what it looks like. And this happened to be called Arctic Dusk, I think it is. But I said, well, I'm from Minnesota originally, so I can feel that. And actually, all these paintings were about 10 years after I moved here. And when the show was up, there was a review of it, and it said, there were all these shades of gray. And that was the first time I realized that, well, they're all gray. I didn't, I didn't know that. Maybe my environment has been influencing me here. Um, so, Anyways, I switched from acoustic and started using acrylic. I had a studio mate, Drake Decknatel, who's now passed away, but he was like an expert in uh, the chemistry of acrylic. And so just by working next to him, I picked up a lot before I even started the acrylic. And uh, like glass beads that I use. I make all my own paint. I don't squeeze it out of the tube. I have dispersed pigments or dry pigments and emulsion. And, uh, pigments and metals and all kinds of stuff and glass beads that I used in the acrylics and I basically worked on them for about 25 years so I don't have the first ones here but you own one of the first ones probably from 92 or something like that and until this last year so 
That's acrylic over there. These two in the back, actually. One that's called One Word Blue, by the way, title on my wife, because she thought it looked like a kimono, but then there was a blue skirt. Uh, that's what the acrylic on the middle section of the side there is cold wax, or it was wax medium with dry fingers. But that one's acrylic, and that one's from this year. Uh, the other one's acrylic, the one up here is acrylic. Uh, acrylic emulsion, glass beads, mixed media, which is much different than the encaustic, because the encaustic you're melting on, you see what happens, you can remelt it, you can take it off. The acrylic, because the thickness of some of them goes on with white acrylic emulsion, so it's like Elmer's glue, it goes on white, then you wait for it to dry, and you think that it's going to be like as good as you thought it was going to be, and 99 times out of 100, it's worse. <laughs> so then you do it again, and you do it again. And so, and there is, don't let anybody fool you, there is some touching up, even though it looks like it all just happened. Uh, they've now, uh, experts have said, which I always knew, Jackson Pollock went back and you know, touched him up a little bit, kind of tweak him. Tweak it too much and they die. But uh, then you can do it again. But lately, in the last eight months, I've been working on encaustics again, because that tall one there, Norman's in my studio, and he really likes gray, and like that one. The top of it had cracked, and I couldn't believe it cracked. And why it cracked? Because that was the only encaustic I did that I put on canvas, but I put it over a board, but I didn't glue it to the board. So through temperature changes like freezing, hot, cold, it developed a crack. So I thought, well, I'll take it off, uh, glue it on, make it another board, glue it back on. So I had to get some encaustic and I went to the art store and I was amazed that it came with these little BBs that were like uh, bleached and now they have the DeMar varnish right in the wax where it's inert so if you don't smoke it up into the air, it's like you could eat it. So you don't have to use interpreter. So these two are actually the last paintings I've done and they're both encaustic. Well, I've done several more since then, but so they're encaustic on uh, and dry pigments on panels. Uh, so I kind of went full circle in this show from caustic to caustic. And what I really want to know is the next time I have the title paintings, who wants to be on my phone list? And say, Help me out. Normal. No, okay. So do you have questions? Do you do a sketch beforehand of what you're going to do? I do. And the materials you're going to that use? That is a good question. Uh, I, I kind of know what materials I'm going to use, but they can change. Uh, at one point in my painting career, I would make sketches and say, you know, these things can move this far. I won't uh, deviate. I might change the color. Or I might change you know, the shape. Basically, I know what I'm going to do. And then I think that Early 80s, late 70s, I started painting the walls and anything that was there. And I just went crazy. Not crazy. That just artistically, it was wild. And then I developed a process where I was much more open with the materials. So I'll do sketches. Basically, any show that you make, you think you're going to kind of do the show that you last did. And how easy it was, because it's all up, it just like came out of you know, Zeus's head and around the walls. Right? And then when you start making it, you think, oh, I forgot how hard this was, and how many failures you have, and how many bad things I can make uh, before I make something good. I'm like a you know, performing musician, a musician and artist, where I can make mistakes, and I think the best things are when I make mistakes, and then move on and make it better. I mean, I had one show in my memory that was so tight, I basically thought, this is pretty good, and now I have to put it up because I have a show in four months and I have to you know, fill up the space. And I was never satisfied with it, the show. Nobody else knew it really except me, but it was like I didn't have time to push it and like wreck it and make it better. Because I basically like to work in a unit of things and say, oh, I'm doing this, oh, this is really good. 
now I can go over and I'm doing this. And all of a sudden this one gets better and that one is like, oh, I can make that one better. And then I'll work in panels that I'll have something and I'll like, tweak it and this, this is pretty good. I thought about that you know, off and on for the years. The, uh, I worked with a figure and, and I developed a very textural kind of expressionistic uh, mode. Uh, as a kid, I would do a lot of landscapes, fishermen, uh, lakes in Minnesota. And I don't think that's completely went away. Uh, this is really kind of corny part of this. I want to cut this. I, it comes back to me when fishing with my Uncle Claire and my dad, uh, both kind of old Swedish guys. Uh, we were someplace, I had no idea if it was in Wisconsin or Minnesota. We went fishing over somewhere uh, on this landing in Murray. I think it was an old fort, and we looked through this rectangle at an Indian graveyard. And all I remember is I kind of went someplace else, and I didn't know what it was, but it was like I had this kind of aesthetic experience. And I kind of go back to that. I don't know what that was. I still don't know what it is, but I felt something. I don't know if it was looking through that rectangle to see a landscape, if it was you know, something to do with something else. But um, I get that feeling when a painting is really good. Um, I, I don't have any other words to describe it, I guess. Uh, but literal elements, uh, I think, are an advantage and a disadvantage for you. I mean, the, literal, the greatest advantage for people knows what they are, know what they are, and say, ah, oh, it's a tree, and then you can get them to the experience you want to bring them to or that you've had. The bad part of that, as my friend Norman would agree or disagree, is uh, they'll look at it and say, well, look at it, it's a picture of a tree, and it's not really about being a tree. It's about the experience. Uh, it's about the experience of the texture, the color, the surface, the scale, uh, the light reflecting off of it gives you. Uh, so whether I want to do that now, no, I don't want to do that right now. What? Maybe I'm scared to do that right now. I don't know what would happen. Maybe I'll do it for the next 20 years. I guess that might be a bad thing. Uh, I don't know if we're good. I don't have any of these. But uh, what paper you were using there? In all honesty, I don't remember. You don't? Yeah, I'm I love guessing, that actually. <laughs> I'm guessing it's probably like a thicker print paper, like arches. Yeah. Because uh, I was working on that for a while, like these four by eight feet uh, drawings I was doing. And so probably it's thicker. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember this, this grid right here. Uh huh. That's like wall tape, you know, when wall you do it. Uh, yeah. When you patch it, you know, right. a seam. Yeah. So it's just you know, that kind of tape. So it's just kind of glued on. Do you ever have people who study with you? Uh, I teach. When? So Where do you teach? teach? At this school. Oh, really? really? Is it? Because I'm old and. Uh, oh. Yeah, I am. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Comparatively. Maybe, maybe. Uh, I teach basically beginning classes. So I teach like uh, beginning drawing, uh, which is like observational. Stuff like that. Uh, how wide, linear perspective. Mm -hmm. Beginning oil painting, mm -hmm. uh, which has, I teach a lot of color. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideas. Yeah, I love the abstract uh, texture. That's what I'm into. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, I'm a golden addict. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've, I've actually talked to Mark Golden, gave him a lot of grief about how much his stuff costs. It's yeah, yeah. Well, I've tried to go to Home Depot and like use other stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, Try to make up other stuff. Uh, I'm supposed to. I was too late this year, but he asked me to apply for a one of the residencies in New oh, York. Yeah. Where they give you free materials. Oh. I thought, oh, I can really dump it. Yeah. Then, like some of the side panels of these are, are golden fluid acrylic. Right. Oh my pigments dry that mix in. 
but then I pour them, and it's like each pour is like mm. $100. Right, yeah. It's like I, you know, I have a lot on the floor. Yeah. yeah. So it's probably not, artists aren't too smart. Yeah. Like yeah. How to get the most bang for the buck. Good question. I'm just curious about the process of the encaustic process that you use for this painting. Oh. Uh, this is an older painting from 1990-91. And I was working with encaustic, which is beeswax and damar varnish, which is very old process that uh, like old Greek sculptures used to be painted with encaustic and look like almost like mannequins, uh, Ptolemy portraits from uh, Greeks in Egypt. Patrick's time and using his funeral portraits uh, on their caskets. So I mean, they're very old and they last a long, long time. The trouble was he had to heat up all this wax on charcoal, it was hard to control. Uh, but that was the binding. His pigments are basically all the same. Uh, I mean, they, there's new ones uh, now that are organic, but they're basically man made. But basically, watercolor, oil, acrylic. Caustic all use the same pigment, it's just a different binder. Uh, these I was painting with encaustic, but at that time the wax I used to get from like a bee farmer and like whittle it if you had day, like whittling uh, wax and just so get little pieces and then I'd put it in a double boiler hook. I think at the time it was still drinking like Hillsborough's coffee, coffee cans. And but the Damar like a sap from a tree comes in like crystals and it will dissolve in like turpentine or mineral spirits. Uh, so it's in like watercolor, which you know, the gum arabic dissolves in water, but so it's sticky. So I would dissolve it with a cheesecloth and with the crystals put it in, in a jar, pour turpentine over it, let it dissolve, and then mix it in with the, uh, with the beeswax and then heat it up. But immediately all the Turpentine goes airborne, and I would not smoke. People would like come. My studio would go, ah, I can't breathe. It's like, what? what? So after a while, I you know, wondered if this was really good for me. And I shared a studio with a person called, named Drake Deckendale, who's now passed away. But he was like a chemist. He would like, uh, go to uh, chemical plants and say, you know, please give me samples of this. And he would always work a deal. You'd use all these additives and things like that. And that's basically, I just by being next to him, I learned all this stuff. Mm -hmm. He used glass beads, which I use a lot of glass beads in the next 25 years. So I mm -hmm. quit encaustics, probably just thinking, well, I loved it. It's very sensual. And you can go back into it, you put it on hot, you can melt it, you can mix hot into hot. Uh, and I had been using it for probably 10 years, and then I switched to acrylic for the next 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman uh, Lundin, who is a well-known national man in Seattle, uh, was in my studio looking at some new work, and this one was on the wall, just kind of to the side, and it cost me, it was probably best to put my panels, because it's really durable since, you know, portraits, you know, 2,000 years have lasted, but you can't bend it because it's really hard. If you bend it, it cracks. Well, this top panel was on canvas. This is, I think, on linen. This is glued to the panel. This was just put over a panel, thinking for lightness. I mean, it was actually a foam core panel. And it developed cracks, and I think it was through uh, getting cold, getting hot, probably mm. no, no heat in the studio, it froze. And so there's some cracks, and I really liked it. So I went to the art store to get some caustic, thinking, well, I'll repair it. Took it off, the panel was on, glued it on another panel, which was really not easy to do. And then I had to go get some more wax. I go to the art store, and guess what? Now the wax is in like these little BB pellets that are like uh, bleached so that they don't have impurities in them, they're lighter than they make some white, and they have the damar in the pebbles. And damar in pebbles means 
then you have to put token time in because they melt easily with the wax. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you don't heat them up to a smoking point, mm -hmm. uh, it's inert. You can eat it. So mm -hmm. You can eat the bar, you can eat the wax. You can't eat cobalt blue, but yeah. uh, you just don't want to burn it to get it air -rolled. Cobalt blue is particularly delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer paradox. Uh, so I repaired this and then I decided, well, why not try some new encaustics? And so for the last probably nine months, a year, I've been doing basically encaustics with some acrylic and then I have lately been doing all encaustics. Uh, so those two there, those two lighter ones, mm -hmm. are actually 2016, and they're in caustic on panels. Mm -hmm. I mix in the same kind of pigments, uh, like basically ground mica pearlescence. That's those, and that's those. Mm -hmm. So I have several. I notice most of the works in the show are, are fairly um, neutral in, in your color, you know, browns to reds to gray-greens and so on. And here we have one that is pretty vivid and you evolved the intensity. Uh, I want you to comment on your use of color. I'd be happy to. Uh, Francine selected the show and she gravitates towards you know, darker things which I don't think means lack of color at all. Uh, I think color is relative. Uh, you know, probably, you know, basically paintings are objects that reflect light. It depends on the light that hits it. The color you probably use in the Mediterranean is different than color that you probably use, use in Seattle. Uh, so people that know me, or that don't know me. When I first moved to Seattle, I was, you know, thought, well, I'm just in a different place. I came here to get a graduate degree in painting. And a few years later, I had a show and all the paintings were gray. I didn't even know they were gray. And somebody said, oh, look at all the grays in Seattle. And it's like, oh, I was just trying to make paintings. <laughs> uh, but I think your eye, a little bit of color goes a long way as a wise man told me. The uh, story of my children who grew up in Seattle, uh, it was like a cloudy day, a little bit of sun comes through, we're going to we're moving, we're visiting the Midwest, and they went, oh my eyes, it's so bright. And I thought, well, oh, that's just a little bit of sun. So I think it is relative. Oh, color is really important in my work, whether it's really dark or as this one has a little more color. Uh, I think the longer you look at something, the more color you're going to see. Uh, I would never make a black painting in the sense of a black with a non-colored base. Because I like paintings to breathe, and I think whether they're gray, they have to be made of color, or whether they're blue, they have to be made of color. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, perhaps you'd say something about, uh, you know, figurative art as opposed to totally abstract art in the sense that uh, the human figure is very easy to identify, identify with in terms of expressing emotion. How, how do you handle that in, in non-objective painting, the, the expression of emotion? Um, most, I mean, we're human beings, so obviously we relate to other human beings, so if we see somebody happy, if we see somebody sad, you can empathize with the other person, because you're a human being, they're a human being. Uh, so I think it's correct in that sense. I think that we also can emphasize with you know, an image like a bowl of fruit, that I'm not a bowl of fruit, but I eat a bowl of fruit, and I look at this bowl of fruit, and, and a good uh, painter of images can make you feel something by watching a bowl of fruit. As an abstractionist, I feel like 
you're the figure or I'm the figure and you're relating to that scene or that surface, that color, that texture, that scale. Uh, not unlike, well, akin to, let's say, Casper David Frederick painting of the monk at sea. You see the monk looking out, you can see the monk's eyes. Like, oh, I relate to that. I'm a person, I'm a monk, they're a monk. You're looking at the monk, what the monk's looking at. And so I feel like my paintings, it's like I just kind of take the monk out and you're the monk looking at the painting uh, without the monk being there.